using a nav mesh. In the previous video we looked at how to use Unity and Blender to set up a mesh to use as a nav mesh. A nav mesh defines the legal locations of an avatar in an environment. But by using a nav mesh you have the added benefit that an appropriate script can parse the geometry creating a database of connections between the triangles in the mesh. Using this database a path can be calculated between points on the mesh. To work along with this video open the file game.js in the folder www forward slash start from the resources you downloaded in the previous video. A complete version is available in the folder www forward slash complete. This example uses modules. If you're new to modules coding here's a useful introduction. Notice that game.js imports a 3GS library, GLTF loader, RGBE loader and dat.gui. These all come from the 3GS repo, although relative paths have been changed in the files. In addition we add 3-pathfinding.module from Don McCurdy's excellent pathfinding library, which you'll find at this address. The readme for the repo has some excellent documentation. There are also a couple of classes that I've created, player and loading bar. More about these in a moment. The template sets up a typical 3GS app with a scene, a camera and a renderer. Because we're using GLB files it's important to add an environment to the scene. This is simply a suitable, usually spherical texture. Here we use the method setSceneEnvironment. This does not refer to loading geometry. Instead it sets up the image that should be reflected in a material that has a metalness above zero. Now is not the time to explain mesh standard material as used by the GLTF loader class. Suffice it to say if you fail to provide a texture for the scene environment property, many meshes will be far too dark as they will reflect black instead. Our work is going to be in the load environment on load callback. Here we're going to set up our pathfinding instance and set up the red ball that will move between positions on the nav mesh as we click the screen. First let's traverse the GLTF scene to find the nav mesh. Enter gltf.scene.traverse child arrow if child is mesh, if child name equals nav mesh, child.material.transparent equals true, child.material.opacity equals 0.5 self.navmesh equals child, else child.castshadow equals true, child.receiveshadow equals true. If we find a child with the name navmesh, then we set it as transparent with an opacity of 0.5. A real application would simply set the child.material.visible property to false. It is important that you do not hide the child itself, just the material. If the child is hidden, then clicking with the mouse would not find the intersection of the mouse position and the nav mesh. It's a good time to review this code. It's defined in the init method. Notice we create a raycaster and add a click event to the renderer's DOM element. In this event we convert the click position, which is in screen coordinates, to normalised device coordinates. That's minus one minus one at the bottom left and one one at the top right. Then we use the raycaster method set from camera to create the origin and direction for the raycaster. The raycaster has a method intersect object that takes a single mesh as a parameter. If an intersection is found then the method returns an array with a length greater than zero. Each element in the array is an intersect object containing several properties, one of which is the intersect point. We pass this to the console for debugging and then call the new path method of the ball property. But so far we haven't set up pathfinding or the ball. Jump back to the load environment method and add this code. self.pathfinder equals new pathfinding, self.zone equals island, self.pathfinder.setzone data, self.zone, pathfinding.create zone, self.navmesh.geometry, self.ball equals self.create ball. Here we use the pathfinding library. We create an instance of the library 
and use the static method create zone to create the database. At this stage the Pathfinder instance has a zone called island. Then we create the ball using the create ball method. Let's take a quick look at this. It creates geometry and a material for the ball, then creates the ball mesh. But the ball is actually an instance of the player class, a class that makes using the pathfinding library more convenient. To use the class you need to pass an options object containing various properties. Recall that we use the new path property of this class to generate a new path. Then in the render loop we use the update method to ensure that the ball moves along the calculated path. Let's take a look at the new path method. First we check we have a pathfinder and if not simply set the target point as a single node for the calculated path property. When update is called in the render method the player object will follow a direct line to the target point. The call to set target direction creates a target quaternion that will position a mesh so it points towards the target. The update method will then interpolate from the current direction to this direction. The real magic happens with the find path method of the pathfinding library. This takes two positions. Here we use the players, the ball in this instance, position and the target position. The zone that we created data for, in this case island, and the nav mesh group, the group the player is currently in. This may return null or a path of length zero, in which case if we're currently displaying path lines we remove them. If we do have a path, then we set the target direction and if path lines should be displayed we generate and show them. A simple example will help you understand the update method. Suppose the calculated path has two nodes, like this. A node is simply a vector 3 value a vector with an x, y and z value. Suppose our avatar is here, pointing in the direction of the arrow. The first target node is this one. We want the avatar to move along this line, orientating it to the direction of movement as it does. The first thing we calculate when beginning a new section of the path is the direction that our avatar should adopt to be pointing towards the target. We use the method set target direction to do this and it sets the class property quaternion. Each update will rotate the avatar closer to this direction by using the quaternion method slurp which performs a spherical linear interpolation. During a section we get a vector from the current avatar position to the target. Then check the length of this vector squared. We're only using squared because it's a little quicker. If this value is greater than 0.01, then we need to move along this segment. We do this by first sizing the vector to one of length 1, normalize, and then multiplying it by dt times speed. dt is the time in seconds that have elapsed since the last update. We now have a vector that if added to the avatar's current position, will move it towards the target. It's possible that by moving this distance that it overshoots the target. To avoid this we compare the distance to the target before the movement with the distance after. If the distance after is greater than the distance before then we've completed the leg. When a leg is complete we shift the first item in the calculated path now the first item in the array is the one that was previously the second. We get the target direction and then repeatedly move towards the new target, adjusting the orientation as we do. If we reach the last node in the path, then the calculated path array will have a length of zero and so we stop moving. And that is a quick overview of navigation meshes and pathfinding. In this much more complex example, the motion of all characters is controlled using these AI methods. You'll find it in the dungeon folder.